from Mary Shelley's Frankenstein to the Lucas and Roddenberry franchises, The Martian Chronicles, and beyond. Science fiction is undeniably a part of our culture. But what exactly is science fiction? And how do you write a science fiction novel? This series will attempt to answer those questions. Okay. Welcome, everybody. We're back with a, another in-studio session with Adam and Kate, and the excitement is here. The excitement is here around spacecraft <laughs> and science fiction. So welcome, guys. How's everybody doing today? Happy phenomenal. Whoa, right? I'm pretty excited <laughs> because I have my sci-fi on. See? It's like rocket ships and moons and stuff. I dug it out of my closet and... Here I am. <laughs> so. And I'm failing. I am failing at the sci fi, like, attire game. So mm-hmm. I need to maybe find myself a shirt. And a if hat. anyone's watching this has some suggestions on, like, t shirts or hats or paraphernalia, like, I would love to hear them. Like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Address Caitlin in the comments below. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so I have, a, I have a special not an option, right? <laughs> yeah. So I have a I have a special introduction, and we're hoping to keep this light motif of content creation going. Um, I don't want to lose the momentum of our roots and and why we started this podcast. So the idea is is that we're putting on display for everybody uh, the creation of a a science fiction novel right? The writing process. And so what goes hand in hand with that process is creativity from a, from a video standpoint. And so here I am as the philosopher in part and in partnership with Adam and Kate, we threw together a little video and we'd like to share it with everybody. Uh, Adam did the voiceover. I did the compilation. Um, and I think next week I'm gonna I'm gonna put that same challenge to Kate for a voiceover. So we'll see if we can keep bouncing that back and forth. I don't know. Are you comfortable doing a voiceover, Kate? Oh yeah, absolutely. I, it would not be my first voiceover. <laughs> hmm. There's a bit of a something there. There's like, a, what is that voice? Do you, I don't know do if you know. Do? I'm kind of a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> That's her maleficent. Uh... Oh yeah, I did. I did have a (laughs) Maleficent character once. (laughs) Story for another time. Okay, okay. So, what did we do? We did the countdown. We're live. We're everything's going great. But now I'm going to actually do another video. So everybody, hold on while I play this this bad boy. World more extraordinary than the one we're standing on. You know, to look past the horizon and not see fear of the unknown, but excitement. You know, slingshotting around the moon, like that sounds insane. And yet here we are controlling that, using it for our own purposes. You know, we can build rockets that fire and accelerate to 11 kilometers per second. I mean, that type of velocity on Earth is crazy, but in outer space, relative to what? So our whole, our whole notions of how we exist, of space and time and velocity and changing, if that is completely different, how does humanity change? And I think that is ultimately the question that science fiction is, is trying to answer, right? How do humans connect and how do they love and how do they respond to the extraordinary? How do they investigate mysteries and keep going with this fearless desire to know more and to build. We build these satellites. We build Skylab, the giant science experiments. We spend all this money on manifesting our imaginations. It wasn't, it was only a century ago that flying was this grandiose new thing. And here, you know, we take the fight for granted. This, these, this concept of drag or thrust, you know, and now we've all seen astronauts in space weightless around. And I think we're on the cusp of something amazing. 
or the human experience can evolve into something maybe we've never even imagined. There we go, guys. If that's not inspiration for us, what you know? What are we doing wrong here? I'm quite proud of that. It only took two takes, and I kind of made it up on the fly. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> good job. Yeah, good watching job. the video out of one eye and recording, and it, it, uh, yeah, very cool. You know Thanks, what? My yeah. initial, uh, you know, you get stalled, right? Because I didn't know. I send it to Adam. Email come back in, you know, a couple hours. It seemed like, oh, here you go. I was like, oh, okay. So it's, you know. Now, I had to gestalt it a little bit because I was trying to think, is that Adam? And then I, but it was Adam, right? And and as actual, his his delivery is some, you know, very kind of like laid back, but like you can, you can sense like the character of Adam in there, which I thought was really cool, <laughs> right? And, and it was, because it was only two takes, it was really cool because I could give him the, the main clip and then he matched his voice so very easily. Like it didn't take me a long time to, you know, shrink a little bit of the of the visuals and then match up with what he was saying. So guys, that if, if you guys can do that, I'll, you know, I'll buckle down and put something like that together with the launch okay. of each one of these pieces. All right. And so the bar is brilliant. set. The bar is set, but I'll raise it just a little bit more because we have to discuss now how, what do we do with that? I don't want it to be buried inside our conversation video. It should be, I don't want to get too marketing on this, but it should have something that, you know, goes to a call of action of some sort, right? Like how do people, what do they do with that video at the end? Do we put something on the end of it and do it as a short? Do we, you know, push it out to say, here's the pre-order to the book, the collaborative sort of experience. How do we, you know, kind of keep a momentum around around what the project is doing. I like think that. we can take these shorts and send them out to people in our network and ask them to do voiceover and see what they come up with. I think that would be really Ooh. cool. Right? I like that. <laughs> and to start, we can you know send it to specific people who we know are interested. Um, and then, and then hopefully, once if people are following and interested, they they. They could uh, speak up, or even we hold competitions or something. I think that'd be really cool to see. Okay, here, you know, I, I saw that clip and I immediately thought about how amazing this concept of outer space is, right? Like, what a crazy experiment to consider, you know, if there was nothing, no equal and opposite force pushing back on you, you know, what would happen? What What is, you know, it's crazy, it's cool, it's amazing. And this idea of slingshotting around the moon, right? It sounds totally bizarre if you the first time you read about that or see about that, they're like yeah, yeah that's how it works in space right it's all circles we just follow them no big deal right um, <laughs> i love the idea of the competition right like um and now one of the things that we do at plank sip is we have a free form associative uh technique for creativity and so the idea is is that we have new contributors that join plank sip and they are given a list of quotes and the idea is not to consult with the Google Oracle and go in and find out who made the quote, but to look at that with your current knowledge set and think, okay, what does that quote mean to me? What are the things that kind of drop into the into the cranium, if you will? What what are the things that, you know, what, what do you think about? And so the whole the whole thing is is that you don't have to stress and strain to figure out how do I want to synthesize this? Basically, you're saying, Oh, I thought about this, right? And you just Kind of free flow with it, and then and then take it on sort of like a uh, on a dendritic journey, myelinating, myelinating into the future. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that's, that's, that's phenomenal. That's amazing, and maybe that's yeah. how we invite guests on the show, right? You want to be on our show? You got to do a voiceover. Like maybe that's like part of the process, something like that. <laughs> um, Caitlin just sent me a, like you know an email like, "Hey, I met this person. It'd be super cool to have them on our on our show, right?" Mm -hmm. I've got a, talking about like the trends of ai and what it's going to mean for the future so i think that i'll have a good i might actually pull some of his blogs well i see i think Daniel. anybody in the science fiction community too right now we're talking about an outward campaign to get some stuff in front of people and say you know free form associate on this 
can you talk about this particular clip, right? We're going to be focusing on these themes. Would you yeah. love to be a guest kind of thing, right? And, you know, our guest voiceover is blah, 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 right? You know, kind of thing, right? I love it. Yeah. That's great. Right. Let's do it. Okay. okay. Cool. All right. Game one. It's a deep breath because it's kind of a lot to coordinate for a weekly piece. But uh, Adam, hats off you. I'd send it to you and it was turned around. So we, you know, we got to do that, you know, kind of quickly. And I know you guys are capable of doing it. So it's fun. I think we got to build <laughs> stuff ever better, ever stronger kind of thing. Right. There we go. Yeah. And we had some fun last week, Dan. You challenged us to... Uh, kind of right from the point of view of developing a time capsule for 300 years from now and what we would put it right. in. And um, yeah. we had some very interesting discussions around this. <laughs> okay, well, let's do some order of business first. I think what do we need to do in the YouTube description, okay, is we should have a working document to this title. Now, we maybe haven't got there. My vote mm -hmm. is a, uh, a Google Doc. But you guys are the authors, so okay. if you'd rather work in a Microsoft environment, and want to do like a uh, a Word doc, no problem. But I th I think the idea is, um, and you can vote it down, yay or nay. But you, what we can put is a a working document where people can comment on it, right? And we start to build out those chapters, right? Love it. Okay. Love it. All right. So. Now, was it was the result of the challenge from last week about the time capsule? Did it did it end in the discussion points which you wanted to bring, or did you guys actually, you know, sketch out or start writing uh, uh, an introduction, or or was it just a discussion? Uh, well, it started by like Adam did this amazing journey and he wrote first and then sent it over to me and and uh you know it was this whole time capsule thing and I'm reading through it and I'm I'm like okay like I love he did this really cool thing where he actually took to talked about what does it mean to be human and took all aspects of humanity and tried to relay that into the capsule which was like super cool right all aspects of who we are but I really struggled. And I said, Adam, I'm struggling with this exercise. And so we had a chat and I said, I don't like, what are you time capsuling? Why is there anything physical to begin with? Like everything will be recorded. Like from this point on, like we've already started recording everything. It's already, you know, if somebody wants to go back in history, they see the pictures, they see the articles. But then we got thinking that um, there is like things that just won't exist anymore unless it's like, in an archive, like a, a physical book, you know, just no one's going to be printing those anymore. We're going to get information differently. Um, you know, we don't think people will even be driving vehicles like the personal gas vehicle. This is the whole concept's not going to be there anymore. You know, 600 years from now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Let me throw an idea your way then, guys. Okay. Let me throw an idea your way. I've, you know, from a philosophy standpoint, I've really thought about this and I think it may dovetail, but it's going to be your intuition about this. Okay. okay. I'm, I'm ready. I'm completely fine with saying, you know, let's stay away from the time capsule idea. I think your intuitions are correct in terms of everything is going to be recorded. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think what would be worth elaborating and explaining and building into the narrative is the recall function capability. So what I mean by that is that our cognitive ability is, and our memory is focused into both, both short-term and long-term recall, this, yeah. these types of things, okay? So we may have a continuous live stream of recorded um, you-ness or me-ness or Adam-ness, right? That we can, but the recall ability is now to recall the digitized version of us to be able to look at us from that third party or third, uh, uh, from that objective sort of perspective, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm very interested in the, in the recall function, right? Um, Maybe building okay. on the Google Oracle, okay? The Google Oracle, okay. you know, it's like you can pull stuff back. Right. But 
it's about being able to pull it back in the most useful uh, and and uh, to the most biological advantage kind of thing, right? Like, what does that look like? So we had a really interesting chat about about kind of that concept, right? Is that like, well, now everybody's up until now, up until the digital world, uh, history was made by the people who wrote it down. Mm -hmm. Right. Like if you took an American history book, you would never hear about the I think it was the War of 1812, where we actually Canada pushed the pushed back all the way to the White House. Right. Like you don't hear about that. That's something that's in Canadian history. So it's really interesting to see the different takes on history, depending on who's writing the book. Well, now where everybody's writing their book. (laughs) Bless you. Now where everybody's writing their their story, their book, their truths are out there. Um, like you're getting so many different perspectives. So he said, okay, how do you verify what's history? Right. And then we, we were talking about blockchain technology and being able to verify Volta like via multiple um sources and then lock it in at a certain point and being able to blockchain history. And so you could say, this has been validated. You cannot undo this. This is history. Instead of it being somebody's opinion who wrote the book. Okay. Okay. Adam, what do you think? Um, So that, you know, that's a really, you know, there's a whole thing there about like, okay, what does that do to people's behavior? If, If history can't be manipulated and, you know, I'm sure it will find a way, but you know, one thing we talked about was, okay, if, if our no, our notion of a time capsule maybe doesn't exist anymore because everything's recorded anyway, so you can just go look all that up. But what what can't be recorded are the individual experience. So like my hopes, my dreams, my thoughts about things, my philosophies, you know. And you know, when you talk about recall, merely thought of you know you see in sci fi movies or reading books where someone could like bring up a persona of a deceased person. It's not them. But the computer kind of simulates them based on the information it has about them, right? So you can have a conversation with your great, 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 great grandfather, simulated, right? Um, and kind of talk about things, about what they're going from their point of view or, or whatever. Um, that might be the equivalent of this you know, time capsule um, in the future. Okay, so is it somewhat similar to the... Um space shard palace that superman had with his father kind of thing hey like story, right? look at that i know right? this reference <laughs> yeah, yeah russell crow right in the, in the man of steel yeah totally yeah so he's like there but he's not there right um so you know and what then happens like if you have this ability to store information and then this wisdom can be passed on um you know, how, how does that affect the uh, evolution of, of knowledge in terms of the human condition, right? We always say we're doomed to repeat our mistakes eventually, right? But if, mm-hmm. if it's being recorded, it's not so easy to forget, right? You know, think about yeah. World War II. If we had mm-hmm. high definition video footage from in parcels, sources and video cameras and stuff of what actually happened there, you know, how would that affect us, you know, separated now? couple of generations differently right uh, i don't know it's lest we forget right lest we forget yeah, exactly. but the problem is to try and bring it back and to and and to initiate an experience again right that's mm-hmm. kind of the idea um if you know and that that's really what i'm interested in is that is that recall ability because if we have a, a society with um a uh a real pluralistic approach to um, to history, where everybody's history is uniquely their own, which I mm-hmm. think is interesting, really, really interesting. We're building silos, okay? And the silos, how do you how do you maintain a use social um, transfer of information between them? Now, certainly, we can reconcile them if we had to, mm-hmm. but the point is, is like, what's that trigger that says I have to reconcile this? Is it a difference of opinion? Right. We now we're running into an issue about how to integrate the, uh, you know, the, the the realities. Right. You're talking about fact versus perception of what happened. Yeah. I mean, right. you, 
yeah, fact, even, you know, it's, it's, it's what the meaning is. The meaning is the, uh, is the, is the concept. Nobody's in dispute of the fact, right? But even a, a, a structure for how we interpret the facts are, you know, is, is also something that's, um, uh, to many cultural theorists is something that is, um, is very subjective. Yeah. Hmm. So we're, we're unified in a sense by an interpretation of whatever our borders, what happened in this war or history or whatever. And it doesn't matter if those facts are exactly true. What matters is that the story we tell about who we are and our identity as a group is the same and that unifies us. So if you now objectively pull all that apart, what happens to culture? Yeah. I don't know if you guys want to take it this way, but I've, I've been you know, like, I, I, I told you guys that I'm working on the, you know, Will Freeman novel. So it's about how to put um, a humanity inside of uh, a woman, for example, and, and mm-hmm. you know, Sophia, right? So this is the idea of, of the love of wisdom. This is the embodiment of, of philosophy is, is Sophia. And uh, you, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm playing with the ideas of, of, of um, biologically saying what is the common the lowest common denominator and then um adam is a as an engineer we talk about you know first principles we talk about foundational concepts and mm-hmm. wh- i'm, I'm going to assert and put something out for you know for for the us to talk about and say the biochemical reactions are shared between me and kate and adam there are only a certain number of neurotransmitters, right? There's only a certain amount of, of, of biochemical reactions that actually occur in our brain in relation to the, you know, the information that we're seeing. So I wonder what it means to focus on eudaimonia and living the good life to understand what that right balance of biochemical reactions are in our brain. And this gets into a whole... It even might crack the do- door open a little bit to psychedelics and, uh, you know, you know, chem- chemically induced states of of euphoria and happiness. But I throw it on the table. What you know is is that what we have to look forward to because of the complexity and the entropy that's waiting around the next corner? You know, I think this is really interesting because we. We had talked a little bit, you know, when we imagined our future, we talked in in previous episodes about like, you'll be able to plug in and you can control your sleep cycles and all this kind of stuff. But I I don't think I had considered what you're talking about, Dan, is like, what if you could also control, you know, the the chemicals in your brain? So like, you want to be happy? Be happier, right? Um, (laughs) What's real, what's not real, right? Um, if you have this thinking that can like temper your, your mood and, and your emotions and all this kind of stuff. And then what does that do to the human experience? Cause part, part of the human experience is this messy disaster that we just have to deal with on a daily basis. And that, you know, that struggle kind of defines us. Right. So, um, you slowly eliminate that struggle. What happens? Right. How do, then we, do we start to lose part of our humanity in that connection? Um, you know, I, th- I think this is a really fun um, sandbox playing uh, when we try and imagine what happens to people, right? Like what? Um, well, just uh, so I think maybe a little bit too, just like um, now we have ethical, you know, laws that are stopping us from going down some scientific rabbit holes, right? if you will, or scientific discoveries, there's limitations, at least in North America, there's, you know, maybe more than other places. But um, I think the future state will still have those. Like, could you do it? Sure. Is it allowed? Is it like, if you're getting chipped in at birth, right, to be connected to this, this matrix, essentially, that you can plug in, jump in and out of, um, that it's still going to be designed to meet government regulations, right? Because it's going to be obviously heavily regulated. It's not just going to be a free for all. So I think there you're going to have some limitations like based off of what the government decides is the system you're going to operate in. Like, I don't think that's going away. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, we don't want to get pulled down too much of a rabbit hole in my, but I think this is really core and really, really important. So although the first task was to say the takeaway was to go and write this, Okay. We did it. You did it. And you guys, but and then, and then, you know, cathartically, we realized that this limitation of trying to imagine something based on the container of a time capsule was let's dismiss it. Let's, and so we've, we've blank slated that, right? Right. And so, and what, instead, my question, we my, question, my question, though, Kate, is this is to say, what do you guys imagine just the the beginning introduction of this type of thing? How are you going to introduce the characters? Is it something that you're going to introduce it as a uh, this particular time period? The struggles, what do you or we're going to parachute right into the 600 years from now? You're dropped right in. Dropped so right our, in. yeah, we like we've drafted up a beginning paragraph and it's essentially uh, characters waking up. And he's not waking up the normal way somebody wakes up to, right? He, like, uh-huh. the system is waking him up, right? Uh-huh. And it's okay. like, so the, it, and it, it wakes you up with a nice, warm, tingly feeling, and all of a sudden you're awake, like full energy, right from deep REM to awake kind of thing. And like, it, the system interacts with your house. And so, like, all of a sudden the, the windows are untinted. So now it's no longer dark, right? Like, you just, everything, integrates but you know he's looking outside and he thinks to himself like man i remember my great great grandmother of you know the alarm clock and people actually woke up to a loud buzzing noise like how archaic is that right and just like they actually had to hang sheets over their windows like they had these full-on sheets over their windows and and people like would pay lots of money for these sheets and have like fancy sheets over their windows just to make it dark and this whole concept is so bizarre to him and then you know like just kind of explaining it through it funny enough through kind of like his experiences when he got to talk to his great-grandmother and pull back their memories right that they can pull forward. And so there is a lot more of that kind of tribal knowledge that you don't just sit down with your grandma and she tells you a story. She like shows you the stories, right? Like when I teach my kids, I pull up YouTube, let's check this out. This is how it happened, right? Um, so it's just a, an interesting way. So you're getting shooted right in, like, and we're going to explain everything as it goes. So there might be like these recall moments, right? So do we, so do we get a, like a like a live read preview of this or is this, and I, before we do that, even if you want to do that, I do have a question about the tingly feeling. So what, what was your thoughts? <laughs> we gonna... Well, the question on that really... cannot read the second longer day. <laughs> you better ask it. <laughs> so the tingly feeling. Okay. So I have like a tingly meter sort of thing. Okay. Now this is a spectrum of tingly experience. So it could be okay. like, shit, my, my foot's asleep tingly, or it oh. could be on the other side of like, orgasmic kind of tingly right too intense (laughs) maybe too much to wake up to every morning right it's like (laughs) because then you just go back to sleep or half half the species would just go back to sleep right right and all that sleep after uh cigarettes would still be a thing (laughs) cigarettes you wake up no so or or there's the tingly like you know when you when you read something or you learn something and those like hairs seem to stand up right like wow that was so cool Right. Okay. I can tell you what I pictured when we were talking about it. And then maybe you bring in a, an interesting point. Maybe that's the setting you can pick. <laughs> okay. Right. Maybe you can pick the setting of how you want to wake up, the feeling or the. You put the chip in. It's like, okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so the people that are kind of masochistic, it's like when your foot falls asleep and you're pissed off and you're stamping it on the ground, that's how you wake up. That would scare maybe. me every morning. I'd be like. Yeah, well, <laughs> you should hear my alarm clock it scares me every morning but i get out of bed <laughs> the way i pictured it was like you know when you walk out into the sunshine after being in the shade uh, yeah that's okay. how i imagined it in my head okay. you know there's so many nice analogies to that and i want to talk about myth for a minute and adam's just wanting to chat I, it's just so exciting so the the ideas of myth um and the 
uh, the, the long human history that we have uh, as sun worshipers, and I don't mean, you know, orange skin kind of, uh, you know, sunbathers. I mean, just the cycle of the sun. The sun is the birth of the birth of everything, right? And so I love that description. And so I challenge, I wonder, can we use that birthing of the novel, of the characters as that feeling, that deep describing feeling of the sun rise, right? Ooh. That would Look be really cool. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> so it's like really poetically get this introduction of the sunrise feeling, and then it starts to explain you know how that 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 alarm clock had work works, right? I love I love that notion, you know. And I think the best books, the the ones that I enjoy the most, the ones that spend the time to draw out that experience. We're just talking about waking up. Are we really? We're talking about the human experience in this setting, and in doing so, we're letting her know the about all that we've created, right? We describe this person having a shower, ready for work, going to work, and then you know, probably there's some kind of uh, problem or small sort of agonistic development in which he has to interact with other people. And, you know, every movie has the intro scene where they're, you know, the cop saves the day and then, okay, that's the hero. We got it, right? Um, so that's kind of how we introduce the world rather than... Uh, you know, just a few sentences or kind of glazing yeah. over it or whatever, right? Like you got to take the time and not only that, but to the character, you got to understand how this character feels about all this, right? Um, my most disappointing reads with the coolest concepts have always been the ones where they haven't taken the time, where I don't connect to the character. By the end of it, I'm like, yeah, right? Um, yeah, we got to really stretch that out. If you If you build something about a sunrise, and realize that that enlightenment process is ingrained in that transition from subconscious to conscious, which is really the difference between a sleep state and a waking state, means it's no longer something that you worship. It's just something of our biology. So it's a sub, like an underpinning of our existence mm -hmm. has to do with, you know, this, this um, movement towards uh uh, the, the 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 felt experience of the sun on your face. I think it's brilliant. But you got to magically write that. Like, really, yeah. it's got to be a piece of art. That opening has got to be... For sure. <laughs> but, I, you know, if, <laughs> if in the future, a large majority of the population lives in space stations, then they won't have that experience, right? You know, you could have people that live their whole lives in space and never actually see a sunrise other than like maybe a simulated one. So then this experience becomes very actually critical to yeah. giving people that feeling of of awe or whatever it is that, you know, that like perfect moment where you're just like perfectly present. Right? Well, you think about this idea of, you know, from from religious sort of wisdom, it says people want to be connected to something bigger than themselves. Mm -hmm. Well, the biggest thing that we know of in at least our universe is the sun. And it's, you know, it shows up like clockwork. So it's like, <laughs> it's there. Oh. It is bigger than us. There is, like, this is the one thing that I just... We, you know, we have this ability to say, to realize the beauty of what my favorite color, for example, is that that the translucent part of green that comes through mm -hmm. the leaves in the photosynthesis action. That if you look at the sunlight coming through that and the beautiful glowing uh, color of green, that's my favorite color. See, because you give me an idea. That it is. I love this because. If we start the book with this kind of scene and really take the time to make this just perfect, later on, like as we go through the plot, where our, what we imagined was this, this person is unplugged, like ripped from the system, dropped off on a planet that's unplugged and first time in his life has to experience, you know, the regular rise and fall of a sunset. And we could just have this metaphorical transformative, 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 transformative experience involving the sun and we related that back right to the very beginning how he wakes up every morning like i get it now i didn't know what that was like it could be this like very beautiful full cycle um 
transformation. I think that would be really neat. I like and that. In the, like, yeah, in the spirit of what's going on behind Kate there, I don't know if there's multiple <laughs> sons, but, you know, we could, you know, be a little cocky there and put a couple different gods in the in the sun sort of thing competing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Anyways, I'm just being a little bit goofy, but, you know, you can kind of, you could, it's up to us. We create this, yeah. whether we're somewhat being tongue in cheek or whether we're, you know, it's it's really cool, right? So I do. Yeah. I think that those visualizations really have to set the stage, um, you know, for, like for the piece. You know, and then, you know, and then like, like, I really definitely when we when he goes back, like when he recalls, right, his his great grandmother's stories, or uh, you know, the great great great. Um, images that they pull forward that gets translated to him. Like, I definitely want to make a deep contrast between like how, how archaic, even though it's like technically today, how archaic it seems, like how raw and vulnerable and like, just almost like when we look back on, you know, Renaissance times and how like just archaic it seems and just like, you can't imagine, you know, but like, the differences, right? And like things that would be intolerable in today's day and age, right? That that was just how they lived back then. That's kind of like the deep contrast we're going to make between the the future state mm-hmm. and present. But it's really, it forces us to take a look at present day and really think like, is this going to be here? And how how truly mm-hmm. archaic are we right now? And that's not an easy thing to do. Let me throw a curveball your way then. Oh, oh no, Adam has okay. a point. Let me just Adam has a point. I want to I want to hear that. All right. This is a, a rabbit hole. I'm just gonna glaze over it. We can maybe return to it later. But when I think of us this notion of a, a sunset and the, the you know, the tingle meter and like being present, <laughs> you know, people in the future are living to be years old. Right, your life is shorter. Are you far present? Are you kind of busier? Is it is it not such a biological concern? Right? You know what I mean? All right, I'm just gonna throw that out there. No, say it again, though. That. Say it again, Adam, because I didn't quite get that. Oh, I'm sorry, did I garble? Um, if we're living longer, if in the future we have the medical technology to extend our lifespan to say 200 years. Right. So, you know, you'd have five or six generations of your lineage alive at the same time. But, you know, when we're living, uh, lifespan right now is like 80 years, let's say, average. So your your um, ability to, to focus on the present moment, right? And, and that, that like pressure, that deadline is looming. So you're much more, you live kind of intensely in that moment for a reason. But if you live longer, then are you kind of less intense? Do you let years go by without like kind of trying new things or whatever? Are you just kind of, does it, you know, does it, ex, does it dilute the human experience? I guess is what I'm trying to say. Mm-hmm. I, I could add something on this. Um, I think there's a really interesting model that if we, and I, hopefully you guys like models because of your consulting background here, but mm-hmm. um Try and make note of this. I think it's a really important thing that that if you sketch it out in a model, um, there's a real kind of psychological framework at play here that directly relates to culture, okay? So if I go back, uh, let's say, you know, 2,000 years, where I, as I always, you know, kind of go back to like ancient Greece, 2,500 years, okay? It's, it's, it's where... Our, the birthplace of culture, at least from a Western philosophy, uh, begins. Now, if the average lifespan at that particular period of time was, you know, 50, we're not saying that there wasn't 70, 80, 90 year old people, but the average life expectancy was, you know, quite lower. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that cultural transmission was different based off of the exact point that you just made. So what we do is we think about 
what it would be like to to grow up and not have the benefit of a mother or a father at at a at a at an age um, that I am, say for example. So I'm 45, and so the majority of people at 45 did not have mothers or fathers on on the on the on in the community. They may have some older people, but instead of going to your your kin based um, uh, instead of returning to your kin and asking your kin and having an engagement with your father, your mother, right? You would be having it with somebody in your, your tribe or your group, right? That elder sort of person would be, you know, in, in the community as opposed to in your household or at the other end of a Skype call or something like this. Right. So what Adam's describing here now is that it's not just that there's one person in the kin, there's, another two to three other people in that lineage type of thing. And so um, like now I'm not going to put any assertion on, on that, but you can see that this is how we form the containers between, you know, the progression from uh, the earlier time period to the future. Right. And Mm -hmm. so we look to the past to understand how would we character, how would we characterize it years ago? And then extrapolate it out uh, into the future, and then just make some assumptions based off of based off of that, right? Do you get what I'm trying to say? Yeah, totally. Yeah, totally. Right. Love it. And this this yeah, forms that's, that's the foundation really... of what the societal mm-hmm. interaction is. It's not like you say this is my idea of what it is. You're saying we're basing it off of the fact that average life expectancy was this and it doesn't even have to be in the book that way right it ha- it can be like here's the reality of the way it is in the future and we take enough time to flush it out and say this is what it is it actually comes out to be a perfect little sound bite to put out you know when you're when you're advertising your book or you know this kind of thing mm. another little video or something <laughs> Yeah, Absolutely. So if I follow this, this path, back in the day, people didn't live long. So like you had like one elder in the village, right? And that was the wise person that yeah. guided everybody. Now people tend to live a lot longer. So you tend to have, you know, uh, parents, like grandparents when you're younger and then parents up until, you know, you're probably in your 50s or, or older even, right? Um, in the future then, if you've got a whole bunch of them plus you have this ability to like simulate and talk to really anyone in history uh, as if they they were there do you now have too much choice would you stay within the confines of your own kin and like your own belief system or would you you know as you you know think of a teenager go seek out that you relate to or whatever and get wisdom from different places and you know is that terrifying (laughs) Are you guys willing to to take this to a dystopian reality, right? I mean, we've got all the beautiful part of the sunrise, but does the dystopian Mm -hmm. reality become very fractured and contentious? And um, it's, it's not a utopia world where everybody gets along. It's like, you know, there's the Adam tribe and the Kate tribe and the Daniel tribe, right? And our, and our independent uh, lineages, right? Mm-hmm. And so describing right. it as actually really, um, it would be kind of dystopian because that doesn't that doesn't sit with us as being <clears throat> ideal of any sort, right? But the descent of man, right, and the the the, the evolution of of humanity uh, or sapiens, mm-hmm. right? It doesn't it doesn't quite not, it doesn't give a shit about that. <laughs> well, and I think. So just back a little bit to Adam's point, you know, you have all these people alive, but if you have access to everything, do you, do you use them? So like, I talk to my mother, like almost, you know, every day, if, if not every other day, but like, do I go to her for recipes? No, I check Google, right? Every once in a while, she'll send me a recipe, but like before, if she wanted a recipe, she was pulling out like Nana's old recipe book. She was going to the, like, to the history. Like she had, that's where she got recipes from, right? 
you know, maybe a magazine, you could cut one out, right? That's how you added some new flavors to your cooking. But now like, I don't do that. I want to cook something. I, I Google the best, whatever I'm cooking. And I pick yeah, the yeah, first. Yeah, recipe the best, that comes up. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the quality of the interactions then maybe, maybe increase different. Right? The, the quality or a difference or, but I, I think that is one thing we wanted to demonstrate. If like if our book had a purpose of her, it was to, you know, if there is a dystopian future where we're not connected, there is kind of like an animosity or a, not an animosity, but a, a competition or, you know, we're not working together, especially in business. Then how can, you know, one individual's transformative experience then affect a ripple effect in, in people around this, this person and, and kind of like the change in not only this person, but hope for the future and society. So that, that's kind of, I think, a grandiose theme that we want to play with a little bit, right? Um, yeah. You know, if one person can change, many can. And so, yeah, yeah. like I hadn't thought of it in terms of dystopia, but maybe that's a good way to set the ground is that it's not all, it's not Star Trek, right? It's not this perfect future where we don't have currency and pollinated and all this kind of stuff it's still messy you know yeah i think okay so are, are you on a, an agreement that we're at least going to discover or we're going to uh go down that rabbit hole kate and try and um explore dystopian um some dy dystopian elements to this this piece a hundred percent so like I picture Blade Runner, like if I were to picture a theme or like a mood, that's what I imagine Blade Runner. Okay. All right. So what I'm going to do, it's not so much that I'm going to do assignments for you guys, because I can't, at this point, I can't give you that next writing piece, right? We're still flushing it out. So I'm going to focus on um, a clip, um, a little montage of about maybe say a minute or two, like I did with Adam. And I'm going to, push it over to Kate and it's going to be on dystopian. Okay. Sounds, sounds good. Okay. So I'll try and get that out in the next couple of days. We're um, getting down to the last couple minutes of today's episode. Is there anything so I else? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wanted to add, you asked if we were going to read and do like little, re we will as okay. soon as we've, as soon as we've agreed on a section, we'll pick some, some pieces and do will read sure yeah and, and always subject to revision because that's the whole idea of what this podcast right. is about is that it, there's no guarantee that it's going to be in the final product just like the time capsule we explore it we write about it we cut it right we add mm -hmm. it we manipulate it we bring it back we resurrect it whatever we want to do uh, the creative process is, you know can can function that way right so yeah that's cool Okay, oh, I, I we're it. in. Let's do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, guys. The countdown works the other way too, so that I think will bring us to a conclusion. Unless, unless there's something else that you guys just is sitting there right on the tip of your tongue. I'll give you one last chance to say it. Otherwise, we're going to sign off for now and see everybody next week. Guys, do you have anything else to add? Not this time. No. I just, I can't wait to see Caitlin's sci-fi flair for next time. <laughs> oh my gosh. Amazon, they need a delivery. What, what am I going to wear? <laughs> awesome, guys. In the future, what will I wear? Okay. Watch for it. Tune in next week. <laughs> see you guys next week.